Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to need a minute here to make sure that everything is set up the way that it needs to be. Uh, but we have something kind of fun tonight. It's different from what I was expecting, but I wasn't I wasn't expecting uh, this thing to become available. So let's just take a quick look. I've got my quality settings. I'm tagged up properly. My God, I already have notifications. Roxon, thank you very much for retweeting and uh, commenting on the... <clears throat> On the tweet, um, I don't think anybody would watch my stuff if there weren't human beings, <laughs> um, you know, getting the word out. I am I am not exactly a marketing maven. Speaking of, uh, I found out that there is a Netflix series called Godless. So good luck to brace yourself in their search engine optimization. Um, I want to introduce this game a little bit before jumping in, <clears throat> and I'm probably going to get the pronunciation of names wrong and all of that, but it would be nice to set things up. So why am I doing this? Uh, it's NextFest, which means there are a ton of demos out. In fact, to give you an idea, and again, I don't, I always feel like 50-50, by the way, lovely, lovely logo there. We'll be definitely talking about that, <clears throat> but I always feel 50-50 about going meta um, because my experience of broadcasters talking about Twitch stuff is either to complain about something that Twitch is doing or to complain about the fact that they don't get enough attention. And neither of these, I think, are particularly good um, discussions. Uh, and the other thing, too, is like when you're talking about good stuff that happens to you, right? There's sometimes this air of self-importance, which I really don't want to communicate. And I think in some of the cases for some people, they're not necessarily trying to communicate, but it can be tough. Like, <clears throat> I didn't want to go down this road, but I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. There was someone who I'd actually given a hand in terms of contacting publishers, you know, and, and getting like a key to to stream a game like just sort of you know here's how you know number one if you don't know who to talk to here's sort of how i find that here's roughly how i position myself and like just kind of pass along some of the stuff that i would have liked to have have known basically <clears throat> the reason why i'm kind of upset with this person is that i actually did need they they had gotten some kind of like a special treatment um from something that I had been kind of cut out from and I you know I was trying to figure out it seemed inconsistent with my sort of the relationship that I'd had with that group but my main contact wasn't there anymore <clears throat> so I sort of said hey you know this is the situation uh would you mind like do you have an email would you mind if I I reached out to some you know someone who you're talking with and they definitely did the whole like oh you know I don't really want to don't really want to ruin a good thing here. And, you know, this is this person who shows up whenever a developer... You, I, this is why I'm a little reluctant to say it, because you do sometimes see them visit the channel, less now. But, like, whenever a developer or a publisher of sufficient size would retweet my stuff, the, all of a sudden they show up and, and you know, happen to remember uh, to mention that they're a broadcaster. Um, so, like, there's that attitude towards things that I don't like. But one of the things that kind of bugged me before that happened was that they started saying that they were sponsored. So they would get a key for something and they would list sponsored, which isn't true. There's a difference between being a key, given a key for you know review and, and um, production purposes. And that's important to disclose. That's different from sponsorship, but sponsorship implies a degree of sort of connection or importance that isn't necessarily there. And it's actually a problem that uh, people are running it. It actually creates a certain, uh, another set of problems. So from my understanding, the people distributing keys do not want you to claim that things are sponsorships when they're not, as I suspect anyone would want. You know, obviously, if you were running a business and you said, I claimed that I had some sort of business relationship with you, this may not be something that you want. So in any case, all of this is to say is that there's a bit of a minefield sometimes in terms of how you present uh, you present certain things. And whenever you discuss uh, Twitch and, you know, streamer related things, um, there is sometimes an air of of self-importance to um, to certain 
uh, certain claims. The funny thing is, is that I went on that tangent and I completely forgot why I was originally going to bring this up. Oh, right, right, right. No, now I remember. Right, because this, this is one of these things which can sort of be taken as me saying I'm super important. Um, one thing that I noticed is that uh, my email box, like I, I knew NextFest was coming up because my inbox exploded uh, with a lot of like, can you play my demo uh, things? Um, and I mean, they're mass emails, right? This is not like, this is not me. I think it, to a certain extent, I'm just getting the same marketing emails that, that you and I do, but there are a couple specific influencer ones. Um, and it gives you an idea of the landscape, right? You know, there's a lot of people with games. Uh, there's a lot of people trying to get attention. And at this point now, you know, there is a specific marketing push to get people to play the, you know, the free taster of a, of a game coming out. But there is a reason why this, this one sort of hit the top of the pile. Genuinely, I would love to play all the stuff that people are talking about. And if nothing else, just because I'm a nice guy. Now, I, lo I love playing games. I love finding stuff that I think is otherwise not, not being paid attention to. Those are some of my favorites because obviously, you know, stuff like Cult of Simulator, a lot of a lot of games like that, um, you know, you don't get them. You don't necessarily find those sorts of things by looking in the usual areas. And I'd love it if I could come up with a way of saying, you know, here's the algorithm for discovering new stuff. Um, but honestly, it's it's luck and it's following people who are making interesting things. And it's, you know, just... Um, being open to trying new experiences, which I realize is similar to an article that I, I recently put out. So it's a topic that's been on my mind lately. Anyways, so with all of that in mind, Godless has uh, climbed the top of the heap. One big reason for this, of course, is that this is from Brace Yourself Publishing, but this, this is not necessarily a Brace Yourself game in the sense that Phantom Brigade or um, or Industries of Titan would be. And I will be returning to Industries of Titan reasonably soon, but I wanted, uh, I, I, I asked my consigliere. <laughs> um, there's someone whose opinion I actually really wanted on this. And I said, I was like, if I were to do one or the other, what, what would you, what would you think? And um, I don't know, there's someone whose opinion I respect quite a bit. Uh, and it definitely seemed to be that, um, that Godless was the, uh, you know, was, was the clear, the clear choice and more importantly it's not something i've tried yet so i do want to set this game up a little bit i've already kind of talked about my you know my my background stuff um so for those of you that don't know uh brace yourself games who are probably best known for crypt of the necrodancer as well as the uh fourth i'll say forthcoming um industries of titan and phantom brigade now both of these games are available uh, for purchase. However, they are, have not gotten their full release yet. Uh, Industries of Titan actually will no longer be getting main branch updates. All of that will be going into version 1.0. However, if you use the experimental branch, you will be getting additional updates uh, before 1.0. But the game is getting really close for a full release, which is very exciting. Uh, and of course, this is not to um, this is not to uh, you know, give uh, give short shrift to Rift of the Necro Dancer, but so far as I can tell, that is not something that you can play on your own. Uh, but Godless is the first uh, first game that is going to be released under their new publishing arm, and I think this has meant some very exciting opportunities for people at Brace Yourself who are, you know, again uh, all ten feet tall and possibly charismatic, and you know, turn everything that they touch into spun gold. Um, but this is going to be, this is something by, the developer listed is Daniil uh, Kalyupa. My apologies if I mispronounced that. Now, um, I did uh, tag them on Twitter, so if you'd like to follow their stuff, definitely feel free to follow through with that. Um, but I couldn't really find a lot of information. Usually whenever I want to look up a game, uh, I try to see, you know, where, where do these people come from, right? Presumably, I mean, maybe this is their first game. Um, but I sort of feel like in a lot of cases, um, there's an iceberg down below and that could be, you know, maybe they worked for a publish, a major publisher first. Maybe they, um, this is actually something Canada has benefited from quite a bit where people will be working for a larger firm, a foreign firm, something like a Funcom or an EA or a Ubisoft. And then they set out on their own. 
and they become sort of self-sustaining businesses. And I think that's a really great feature of Canada. And I think some of these have come up through things like the Canadian Media Fund. I'd actually be very interested. Once upon a time at work, I tried to do a project which was to try and analyze these sorts of things, but I couldn't get a lot of traction for that sort of study. But I think it would be interesting to see what role, if any, some of the government supports have had in terms of uh, in terms of building that talent. But one way or the other, um, this is uh, the first game I could find associated with this developer. Uh, and I will start with the Steam page, actually. So the, uh, the first capsule, the write-up that we have here. The time has come for humankind to meet their maker. As the sole surviving god in the war against mortals, you will lead your loyal followers and rain destruction upon the world. Give humankind a taste of your wrath in this turn-based strategy game with roguelike and auto-battler elements. Actually, what I can do, let's uh, turn on the main, main screen. And... Um, we can we can read the copy together i don't know if i can uh zoom in no i'm sorry i can't zoom in when it's steam so uh early access game it's not uh oh wow this is coming out soon october 11th hey rarmonger good to see you um early access game Godless is a combination of a roguelike and an auto-battler with many overlapping systems from both genres. To make sure it works well and feels right, we need the help of a community to test it out. Approximately how long will this game be in early access? For 8 to 10 months? That is not a lot of time when you think of it. Um, how is the full version planned to differ from the early access version? The final version will include more content as well as deliver an extended storyline. Also, a few gameplay systems and mechanics will be added to enhance the replayability of the game. What is the current state of the Early Access version? Most mechanics and systems are in place. There are two out of four acts available, which is more than enough to get a good feel for the game. However, there is only part of the main storyline currently available in Godless. Will the game be priced differently uh, during and after Early Access? The price will increase from $9.99 during Early Access to $14.99 on full release. Um, I actually, to a certain extent, so there's two ways I feel about this. It's like I kind of prefer it when developers do this because I do think that the finished product is worth more than the earlier one. But I also don't feel that... Um... By the way, I totally forgot. I, I, I was wondering where that reference was from, Rarmok. That's the, the Zero Wing introduction you were referring to. And I thought, oh, the penny only just dropped now. Um, sorry. Um... <clears throat> But um, <clears throat> that's a really good opening music track, by the way. Like, as, as silly as the, the translation is, it, I, I kind of get pumped up when I hear that music. I've never played the game. I've just seen that, that video. But, like, I remember, I remember, like, laughing at the dialogue, but, like, then, like, listening to the music. And I'm like, you know, this is actually kind of exciting. <laughs> No one played that game, yeah. Well, nobody's playing this game. Well, sorry, nobody on this stream is playing this game right now, so I'll, I'll stop talking about other games. Sorry. But yeah, so the, the difficulty that I have with this is that I don't actually think games should be priced less in the early access period in the sense that... Like, so it's, it's a bit of a paradox to say that, right? Well, not a paradox, but like, I'm contradicting myself because to a certain extent, I think it, that it is good that they're charging more when the thing, full thing is released because... People have, um, you know, there, there is an object of greater value, but I also don't think people should discount the game early um, because that's something maybe that you do, like, later on for price discrimination reasons, basically. I don't think anyone... Like, that. the term price discrimination sounds really horrible, but, like... If, if you're a game developer and you're trying to, like, sell something, it's actually kind of important to understand and apply. <laughs> um, it's not the same as discrimination in terms of how we normally think of it, let's say. <clears throat> so, yeah, the tr I guess what this implies is that I think developers should charge full freight at the start of early access and then raise it above what the game is actually worth afterwards. Anyways... Clearly, I do not have a coherent position on uh, pricing, but either way, uh, when October 11th comes out, comes along, 
um, you will have eight to ten months to buy this game at a pretty considerable discount to its uh, finished um, finished experience. By the way, this is not like an exclusive demo or something like that. You can all uh, download this on Steam and play it yourselves as long as you are on Windows. I don't know if there's uh, plans for support on other platforms, but it is uh, made in Unity because the nice little Unity logo popped up when I started. Uh, anyways, how are you planning on involving the community in your development process? The community's feedback is crucial to consider as it will show us what we should focus on as we add new content to the game. Our plan is to stay actively engaged with player comments and criticisms and do our best to address issues brought up by the community on the Steam forums. So I suppose that implies that there isn't a section. I actually want to take a quick second here and see if there's a section for Godless on the Brace Yourself Discord because I really like... Uh, shouting out the Brace Yourself Discord? No. All right. So yeah, if you want to give him some feedback based on this demo, <clears throat> to the Steam forums with you. Hopefully it's not like other Steam forums. All right. So um, the Brace Yourself connection is a huge one for me, right? Like, you know, if you're Firaxis, if you're... Brace yourself, you know, there's a handful of publishers. It's not just those two, but like there's a handful of, of publishers or developers where it's like, I don't even really care if the reviews are negative. I'm going to want to try this thing for myself and see what's going on. But there is another thing that I'm interested in here, which is that I have yet to really play an auto battler that hooks me. So I did used to play Dota. I actually like wanted to install Dota again and then I saw that it was 40 gigabytes and I was installing it on my hard drive which sort of locks up the rest of my computer and I'm like that's a disrespectful amount of hard drive space to, to store up because like I, on Twitter I, I phrased it rhetorically which is always a mistake because then you get people like replying with really obvious stuff like of course it's the the DLC or not the DLC the microtransactions that they add like it's the hats um but, like, Bungie recognized this problem with their game and vaulted some of the content to make it easier to maintain and, and a little more respectful for the players. Um, whereas Valve has sort of decided to blob the thing out. But anyways, like, I obviously I'm interested enough in Dota again, too, until I saw the, the uh, like, download size. Um... I was interested enough to, to try it again, and I did try Under Lords. Didn't quite connect with me, but then there was like, I think Auto Chess was the start of the Auto Battler genre. I think Team Fight Tactics is kind of the dominant one. Um, auto Chess now has its standalone, which I think is an epic exclusive. And you know, there's also a bunch of sort of, yeah, 40 gigs of heights is still a lot of hats. Like in fairness too, like there's some stuff. Like the thing is, I I have a pretty large collection of dota stuff um like i've got the stanley parable announcer i've got a legendary for um vengeful spirit because i like i really liked that character as the first character i felt that i i was quite good at by my standards not like in an absolute sense. it's on the internet right as soon as you say you're good at something it's always going to be like 500 people who are you know, completely out of your league and will let you know in the bluntest terms possible. But like, it's it's the first character I really felt I had a good handle on that I knew how to play and could get an unexpectedly, you know, high um, uh, win rate from. It's Java TV, good to see you. Um, but yeah, like obviously, like to quite literally double the size of a game based on the potential you know, or like just because somebody bought a cosmetic and, and the developer really wants you to be able to see it. I kind of feel like there's a certain point where you're like, come on, guys, like, really? <laughs> um, and I totally understand they need to make money and stuff like that. But that that really is like, I, I, I really wish there was a better way because I like that was enough for me to not play the game. I was going to give it a try right up until that moment. Anyways, I'm sorry. It's like 15 minutes or 20 minutes in and I'm not not playing godless. So where I wanted to go, though, is that especially when there's like a trend in gaming or when there's something that I don't understand very well. So like for a long time, I couldn't quite get the appeal of roguelikes. Like I tried Rogue and I'm like, 
what the hell is this game? I can't tell what anything is. Like, why couldn't they have real graphics? And then, of course, like, now I know better in terms of how, like, the history works. Like, if it had graphics, it would have been a very impressive game. Well, I mean, not that it wasn't impressive at the time, but, like, you know, there's a set of expectations that I have for what a game is that did not necessarily apply to when Rogue was first made. You know, I really liked Risk of Rain, which is described as roguelike. But obviously that is a very different experience than what uh, something like Sword of the Stars of the Pit, uh, the Pit or Crypt of the Necrodancer or... Um, God, there was another one. Oh, um, Eyes of Taj, Tajmail or, or whatever it is. Hello, Index Gnome. Good to see you. You know, there's there's a few other games which are a little bit more clear in terms of the connection with roguelike. So, or with or rogue inspired or whatever term you want to use. So with that in mind, I have found that there have been some games that are actually very good hooks for me to get into a genre that previously I'd not spent a lot of time on. And certainly the auto, auto battler is, is one of those. And in fact, the thing that's funny is one of the things that I'm not crazy about in the auto battler is that I feel like I don't have a I don't have control over the units which I don't um, and that's been something I sometimes negatively respond to so what I'm interested in is is seeing how godless deals with the fact that on paper I am not the intended market for this game but it does look interesting uh, enough and also it's from a you know a publisher that I'm interested in that I, I wanted to share this with you so that's my long-winded introduction to godless we're gonna be going in pretty much um, you know, clean. I did. Uh, I did check to see that it would be working uh, for the stream, but Act One: Kingdoms of the First Alliance. I thought there was a tutorial. I might have canceled the tutorial. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah. Um, okay, well, <clears throat> the Elvish Refuge. Long ago, this land was a barren desert. Then came the Elvish Druids, who nurtured and invigorated it with nature magic. So it'll tell us uh, the enemies that we're, we're up against. So essentially, the idea here, as we described from the... You finally finished Lord Stab's playthrough. Oh, thank you very much, Java. Um, I actually just wrapped up um, the uh, Dancer run recently. I sadly am going to have a delay for when I when I do another set of VODs, and that's I was originally planning to come back uh, next week. Was it next week? Sometime around next week. Um, but something's come up, and it's a really cool opportunity, and I'll get to share it with you, but hush hush for now. Um, but uh, the good news is there will be videos. And we'll get a chance to, to share all of that. So, the basic idea, uh, as far as I understand it, you are a god. Um, there was a rebellion against the gods, which killed off all the other ones but you. And you want your revenge. And so, essentially, you will take out a continent by uh, defeating all of the waves. We can be told you know, what we're up against. So, we've got an enslaved ogre, deals damage to all adjacent enemies. A battle sorceress, able to teleport to the shrine. Uh, two battle sorceresses, and then another enslaved ogre and a uh, battle sorceress. But this first fight is pretty straightforward. Uh, when can you be expecting it, or is that also hush hush? It's not hush hush, but I'm not sure myself because I may wind up with a lot of video that I need to need to record. Okay, so first things first. <clears throat> Look, you came into this uh, demo looking for gods. Am I going to be disappointed? It says godless right in the title. Or perhaps you are learning that God less is God more. In which case, you got... I actually have no way to finish that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the first thing you need to do is place your shrine. Now, uh, the terrain will have different effects. And again, I could be describing things that are taken for granted for... Um, for auto battler fans, but I am going to... I'm going to say I, um, 
yeah, I'm, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna take that for granted. I'm gonna say I want to. Um, I want to uh, kind of go in with the level of knowledge that that I have, or rather, didn't have at the start. So you place a shrine. This is your king um, or your ancient, if you're playing, uh, you know, something like a something like a, um, a MOBA. You can place it anywhere on the board, but clearly some spots are better than others. So there are terrain effects. So in this case, uh, forest each turn, add plus two health to a unit on this tile. Uh, if you go to the swamp each turn, it deals three damage to a unit on this tile. I am assuming that it's hard mode <laughs> to put your shrine in the swamp. So you can consider your shrine to be a unit um, just like any, any other one. Uh, I think the fields or the plains are wide open and of course we're not able to put anything on mountains enormous snowy rock formations that cannot be traversed so you don't you aren't told this um, but I think the first strategic decision to make is pretty obvious where do you put your shrine and chances are the answer is going to be as far away from the things that can hurt it as possible now, so far as I can tell, I do not believe you are obligated to spawn things next to the shrine. So one spot that seems interesting to me here is to actually put the shrine in this forest here. So we'll say we're a wood god. It would be kind of interesting if you get different god types so that your interaction with different um, territory would be different. So, you know, I'm a marsh god, so I actually get healed by the swamp. Um, but uh, that's not how it works. So. Um, what I would think here is we go to the forest so that I can build up my health. But the enemy actually needs to traverse uh, two swamp tiles to be able to to be able to do damage to me. Now they have got quite a bit of health, you know, 22 and 17 here. But this is far away from them. It's behind what I would consider, you know, it's my moat basically. Um, and there are some other ones that are a little bit like that. So you know, I could put something here, and again, they'd likely wind up traversing more than likely traversing a swamp. But one thing that's kind of nice about this is that there's one or two spots here and here where my shrine can be attacked. If I put a unit here, there's two that are not, or sorry, there's three that they can attack from and two of them are ones that actually heal the unit. So the thing that's nice here, I guess in this case there's three as well, but there's actually, hang on, it might be, yeah, yeah, no, it's still the same. So uh, places that you can attack my unit in this area, one, two, three that damage you, two that heal you, and one that's uh, neutral. Whereas in this area, there's two uh, neutral that you can attack me from, one that damages you, and one that you can heal from. All right, so you get a certain amount of mana. Uh, using mana, cons uh, sorry, using skills consumes mana, get one each turn. Um, prediction, see units intentions uh, for the next turn by pressing left control. So in this case, we know uh, the, el the battle sorceress is going to go to the forest. That's going to mean uh, some healing. And the ogre also is going to move to the forest. Now, I don't know quite how the AI handles uh, these, kinds of, um, these kinds of maps. I'm going to assume <laughs> that, the, um, that the AI is basically going to rush your shrine. And so um, the reason why I think it's kind of important for me to make some, at least understand the assumptions that I'm making is that this whole idea about whether or not I want my shrine far away is based on a certain set of assumptions about how this game works. Let's say that the AI had a little bit more, um, you know, a little bit more thought in terms of how it wanted to do its turns. Like one thing it might do is take the long way around, right? So, you know, let's just think. So uh, two health, four, six. I mean, if I really want to make it a long run, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Sure, <laughs> I'll take three damage. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> You know, this is, I'm going to be dealing with a pretty, a pretty sturdy little, um, little combatant. No dying on stream. No, I'll, I'll save the death for, uh, for after. And again, it's worth remembering that we don't control our units. So we're going to run into the same, uh, the same problem. 
but uh, but yeah, so it, it may be that my decision to move the uh, to move the um, the shrine back here that could have some consequences. But again, what I find helpful in these sorts of cases is if I can articulate for myself why I'm making certain decisions. If the if the strategy falls apart, uh, it gives me a chance to say, okay, I understand why this broke, and I you know now I know what to do for fixing it. Let's say. Uh, so here are what we can do. Again, it's going to cost us mana. So uh, one mana for the two here and two mana for the middle item here. We've got a tribal priestess. Each turn adds plus one health to all adjacent allies. However, they do two attack and have five health. Uh, I also have a swordsman. So you'll notice that my units are considerably weaker than my opponents. However, the swordsman deals double, double damage if the target is weaker. Now I'm going to right click to see if there's a little more... Weaker says a unit with less attack than this one. So this is important, right? Because actually I'm also curious about uh, neutral. Uh, take the skill into the battle uh, to get plus five random energy as a victory reward. Okay, it's a unit and a cost. Uh, nature element, take the skill into battle to get five nature energy as a victory reward. Oh, interesting. So there are different kinds of uh, gods, I suppose. Well, it says energy, but... <clears throat> and then finally, uh, tile, so a place of power. This is neutral, counts as a tile. Tiles are areas on hexes that have special effects. Uh, each turn, add two attack to an ally on this tile. So, and I believe the effects happen after... I think you the effect triggers at the start of the turn, then you move, and then the start of the next turn, you get your, your other effect. So um, my Swordsman is not going to be that useful against the Battle Sorceress at the start. Uh, they are, however, going to be pretty helpful against the Ogre. However, they're only going to be able to withstand two turns of attacks from the uh, Ogre unless something else happens. So they're not going to be able to... Was double damage actually? So yes, they do take out a they do take out an ogre. So let's start by deploying one of those now, as hoped for, I suppose. Uh, we do get to deploy our units before before the or anywhere on the the battlefield. One thing that I think might be kind of interesting is if you were to uh, summon a unit. So you, let's say you summon a unit and then it. Um, uh, sorry, what was I going to say? Like, you summon, like, let's say we summon them way further out on the other side of the, the, the map. Like, does the AI prioritize taking out your units or are they going to go for the main objective, which is the shrine? Um, that's not a, that's not something I really want to test. I want to put something against the ogre for starters. One thing that might be interesting is to actually deploy to this forest. So that means I'm going to be taking damage a little early, but it seems like a it seems like a good opportunity so maybe we'll put the swordsman down here now i don't get to control where things move um so what i think i can try and do here is the put down the tribal priestess now the drawback here is that the tribal priestess is likely going to want to try and attack the enslaved ogre and so they may wind up in the swamp or they may take the path to the forest uh, the other thing I could do is deploy them in the forest, but they're almost certainly going to move into the swamp here. So I'm going to try and move this unit here, and we'll see where they go. Yeah, so in this case, they wound up going into the swamp. That means they're effectively going to going to die in two turns. But they will be reinforcing the swordsman, which is the main purpose of uh, having, having this unit. So we've made our choices. Uh, not particularly happy with the computer's choices, but... Um, you know, again, a part of this was just to see what logic the game would employ uh, in terms of accessing the ogre. It is kind of funny, right? I would consider for self-preservation, 1-2 is superior to 1-2. So I'm not quite sure why the, like, why the game is making this particular decision. Um, but I don't think I'm supposed to know. So let's end the turn and see how it turns out. Oh, interesting. So they did wind up going in the other direction. Well, so how does that work then? 
So they're probably going to uh, go toe to toe with the battle sorceress, but we do get the opportunity to heal my own uh, my own unit. Now I think they s don't. They'll probably be able to survive the ogre one more turn, which is nice. So. The decision I need to make right now is, do I want to bring in another Tribal Priestess, or do I want to uh, save, gain the mana so that I can have another Swordsman? Given that the Swordsman is my main combat unit, I probably want to save up this turn. So we're going to end the turn and see what the next one is. Or see what happens next turn. So this unit dies before they can do any uh, any kind of an attack. Now, I'm curious. Yeah, so I'm going to wind up moving into the swamp. It would be nice to dislodge. So one thing I was thinking of is it would be nice to sort of dislodge this particular unit. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a swordsman down here because I think they'll be locked into combat with this sor battle sorceress. I'm going to lose this unit Um but this is going to allow this unit to heal while they're attacking the Battle Sorceress, which gives me a little bit more time to just sort of generate some mana and uh, and move on. So I'll start with the start with the Swordsman there. They shouldn't be moving. Now remember, we're not going to do extra damage to this particular unit. Um, Okay, so we die to the swamp this turn. This unit will probably move forward. But, uh, counter to our expectations, this unit's actually going to start... Um, actually, I'm not 100%. I think we actually wind up attacking them first, so we will be able to take... Uh, nope, because I uh, get clobbered. But I think this unit will move and attack. But yeah, for some reason I thought they were going to be standing still. Um, either way, I think this unit will move in and attack, and that will save the day for me. Um, in fact, I originally wanted to save, but if I replace that swamp with a place of power, I get extra attack. Okay, plus one enemy level. All right, well, we've got our work cut out for us. Now, the good news here is that this unit is going to, like, these two are going to wind up, um, uh, so this unit does double damage because they have a higher strength rating. Um, the problem, though, is I don't have a good reply for this unit. I think what I'm going to want to do is put down a swordsman, because what's likely going to happen is they're going to wind up occupying this location. Um, so I'm going to wait the one turn for the mana for the swordsman, once they lock themselves into the swamp area, then I deploy the swordsman and we keep uh, keep the sorceress in place, um, taking damage while everybody heals. So it's worth remembering, I think the Swordsman's actually going to wind up moving into a Swamp Tile. Oh god, this guy cannot... has never met a Swamp he doesn't want to walk in. Um, I believe if I deploy a Swordsman now, uh, the Swordsman will move to the Swamp Tile, so I want to end this turn. But what I'm going to do next turn, once the uh, Elf moves into place, I'm going to deploy not only a Swordsman, but also the Place of Power, uh, so that they get the, um, the attack bonus. Of course, they're going to have to traverse the swamp later, so they may not survive to the uh, to be useful in that sense. But we'll we'll deal with that later. Interesting. So they want to go to the swamp. Um, either way. Um, now, again, I'm making a choice here, right? This unit is definitely going to die, and they didn't need to die if I put the place of power down. But the catch is, is that I am sort of relying on this to act as a bit of a buffer 
uh, for the shrine. Not as much as I'm relying on this mode, obviously. And essentially, I'm committing myself to, you know, spending a lot to preserve one admittedly strong, but not necessary member of the team. So we'll pass the turn. I should be using the mouse more because it's a little easier for people to see, but... And I think we get our combat bonus at the start. Yeah, so we're going to do double damage. That should actually take out the unit. Yeah. Okay, so the ogre is going to be a little complicated to deal with. Uh, unsurprisingly, we wind up in the swamp. Um, but I can give myself even more... Well, I don't need to deploy the place of power right now, I suppose. In fact, what I can do is I can deploy the Tribal Priestess here, for reasons that will become apparent. So we get a combat uh, boost, we move into the swamp, I replace that swamp with a place of power, and then we fight the ogre uh, in, the, in the moat. Oh, that was unexpected. So what happened there? On move deals six damage to all adjacent enemies. I was not expecting that, so I should be taking a look. Um, on attack, teleports to the shrine. Interesting. Well, that's definitely put me on the back foot. Um, I'm going to have to end the turn because I, like, I do need a... Um, I do need a swordsman to handle the ogre. All right, that's the worst possible place they could have wound up. So I need to decide who am I, who am I more worried about? Um, so this ogre wants to move to the place of power. I'm going to put the swordsman down here. So we'll be able to, to fight them there. This does mean that the battle sorceress is going to be able to work my shrine for a little while. But of course, this is why we've been in the back row sort of healing up for a bit. We will deploy... Uh, not just a swordsman, but a place of power in a couple of turns to help deal with them. Good lord. Alright, I'm in some trouble, actually. Um, I'm going to end the turn because I need to deploy swordsman for this. Okay, so I'm going to start with a swordsman to deal with the ogre, um, and then when I can, we'll deploy to deal with the super elf. Okay, uh, I'm going to deploy a place of power for starters. Now, I don't need to worry so much about healing, but I am going to just, you know, give myself a bit of an edge because I do want to take the unit out as soon as possible. Although at this point, it's overkill. There we go. So definitely got a little dicey there at the end. It's kind of neat that the game sort of, um, uh, sort of pulled the, the rug out from under me. Uh, I like that it did that. Uh, and uh, as you can see, we are annihilating the continent, exterminating it of all life. Um, presumably this god does not need worshippers. All right, what are the rewards? Okay, so you got a new skill that summons a unit. Quick to continue, this is an orc warlord to attack. Five health on attack adds this unit's attack to all adjacent allies. That seems really interesting. We're going to need to find a better way of handling the... Um, we're going to need to find a better way of handling like swamps and stuff like that, but I can see how this can really get out of control. Um, click any slot and pick the acquired skill to use it in the next battle. Well, presumably we'd use the empty slot. 
And we've got Ether, use it to purchase valuable goods and services across all continents. Uh, five Nature Energy it told us that we were going to be getting that by deploying, actually with that in mind, the Orc Warlord is Fire Element. Um, and then 10 Fire Energy, uh, use it to learn talents in the chamber. No problem, Shaba. So I'm curious, you've now all seen the first level, Impressions of Godless? How many of you are rushing out to try this demo now? Oh, interesting. So we get uh, one of three paths to the next uh, continent. So uh, Antarta Kingdom, despite its harsh rule and reputation for ruthless court intrigue, Antara is known far and wide as a place of prosperity. How you doing, Vanguard Master? So I notice I can't uh, right or left click on these units to find out what they do, but I do have some information. Um, I do actually have some information in terms of what the um, what I'm going to be coming up against. Uh, feels like you you just got here, so you haven't seen anything. You got to do it all over again now. But Vanguard, you get to download this uh, uh, as part of Next Fest. Oh, this is interesting. My health carries over over multiple playthrough uh, over multiple levels. So this I'm actually in quite a bit of danger um, at the start here. Um, but yeah, so we've got uh, the battle sorceress and the enslaved ogre. We know as they get as they move up in levels, they become more dangerous. So. The Enslaved Ogre doing six damage each time it moves uh, was really something that caused me a lot of trouble. Uh, fortunately, we won't have to deal with that. However, the Battle Sorceresses will not be that easy to take out if I don't have units that have survived into the next run. So you wish you had time to play. You really want to play Manor Lords. That was actually one of the other ones that I was asked to do a demo for. I'll try to. I mean, again, I don't. it's not that I don't want to do the games that I don't cover, but... Um, We'll, we'll see. Maybe in a couple months you'll have downtime. Yeah, I hear you on that. Okay, so Forge. Merge, uh, merge sparks of creation into gems. I don't know what gems do, so that doesn't... Doesn't quite give me what I, I need to know. A merchant, buy various goods for ether. And chamber, acquire talents using magical energies, which presumably are these. I think I'm going to go for the merchant because it gives me, at least then I'm selecting the things that I'm going into, but this is presumably the roguelike element they were talking about. Oh, you do this in between. Okay. I thought that might be like a reward for finishing the, the battle. The dimensional merchant has been trading with divine beings for centuries. Get him ether and he'll get you anything. Okay, so I can get... Um, a spark of nature, use it to create gems in the forge. Spark of death, use it to create gems in the forge. We can get additional skills, so unholy touch, swap the attack of two units. Protector of nature, passive, always uh, attack is always equal to health. Interesting. So that's a... I'm curious how that equality works. So if you think of it right, like... That means that the attack is set by health, but that could also mean that if your attack goes up, your health goes up. Um, overgrown ruins every turn adds plus one health to an ally on this tile. So this is the health equivalent of the place of power. An orc shaman, all adjacent allies attack enemies immediately if possible. That's an interesting one. Maybe not something I'd want to spend two mana on in its current form, but... It's also worth remembering we have to remove something from the uh, lineup if we do uh, do this. Well of Souls resurrects any units that die here with one health. Works once per unit. Hmm. And Furious Brute on attack pushes the target on every second attack. Alternatively, we have Scrolls. Uh, scrolls are powerful one-time skills that you can use in battle. Also, they don't consume mana. So, resurrect the last ally that died. Uh, deal 12 damage to any unit. Raise the dead. Okay. I'm slightly tempted at this point to... So, like, I was thinking, like, well, maybe I pick up a Spark so I can see what they're like and then a Scroll, but I, I can't really do that. But maybe we buy two Scrolls. Um... And I suppose the question is, do I go for the Thunderbolt to immediately destroy something, or do I raise the dead? 
Um, actually, Light of Hope seems pretty strong as well. Let's do uh, Raise the Dead and Thunderbolt. And we don't have any ether left, so. Supreme Ruler 2030, Homeworld 3, Victoria 3, Superpower 3, and maybe Rimworld DLC is all I'm waiting for. Or is there another DLC coming out? Also, if Superpower 3 is the one I'm thinking of, that's another Canadian game. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, this is unexpected, but I actually want to draw your attention to this. Uh, Brace Yourself Games actually just went live. However, they are not playing Godless. It is Chloe and Vivian uh, doing art streams. So, um, but yeah, that was a chance for me to... Uh, actually, I didn't need to copy and paste like that. I could have just uh, hit... Oh, cool. But yeah, um, that wasn't the original reason I was uh, bringing that up. I actually wanted to see... That is the game I'm thinking of. So Golem Labs is based in Sherbrooke, Quebec. So uh, another Canadian game. Homeworld 3 is a Canadian game. Uh, never heard of Supreme Ruler 2030. Let me take a look at that one. Remastered edition to the Supreme Ruler game series. One of the most comprehensive real-time geopolitical strategy games for PC. I mean, it sounds like something up my alley. Um, <clears throat> I am curious about... And of course, it will not surprise you to learn that RimWorld is also Canadian. <laughs> so yeah, there's Royalty, Ideology, and Biotech. I actually only have base RimWorld, and I have not made a lot of progress in it. Anyways... We've turned the Elvish Refuge into two sc uh, two scrolls. Now we will go to the Anta uh, Antarctic Kingdom. Well, this is an interesting one. Um, so what's kind of funny here is that I almost prefer this spot as a location for my shrine for the same reason as like the old, uh, the old one. It's just obviously a really big risk with the ogre here at the start. Um, and I am in a spot where I want to be healing as much as I can. Another appeal is here. So this, there's two places to attack me here. There are four. So yeah, this makes a little more sense for the shrine. Uh, we are going to start with a swordsman in the forest. Uh, so they'll be doing double damage. Now I could put down a place of power if I want, but I think it makes a little more sense for me to save the mana because we are going to want to deal with a battle sorceress. Although remembering that uh, the battle sorceress will teleport once the... Um, uh, once they do a successful attack, so I want to be a little careful about when and where I attack with the Swordsman. Now, sadly, they're not going to be able to survive an at another attack from the Ogre. Um... So I didn't really think this through. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the swordsman here. We'll at least get a couple of points of health out of it. Uh, and I think I'm just going to have to accept the loss on the other side and hope that the ogre falls to, to the swamp. Okay, now, uh, one thing I could do is put down the place of power so that they take out the battle sorceress first turn. Ah, oh, 
that's right, they got there. I was gonna... S oh, wait, no, we still get to take him out. Okay, so I want to make sure that there's nothing to... Uh, nope, so they also deal damage on a move, so this is gonna be a problem. Uh, and they all want to eat my shrine, so... So I think the sad reality is is that uh, my unit gets taken out before. Yeah, I think they get taken out before they can attack. Oh no, uh, we do 20 damage because they don't move. So part of this is also about healing up my um, my shrine, but in this case, I'm just really trying to keep the barbarians at the gate. Unfortunately, that uh, I'm no longer able to improve the power of my character. Okay, that bought me a turn. Oh wait, but they're going to move immediately after uh, the attack, so that doesn't get me quite what I thought it did. Yeah, we knew that was coming. Okay, um, so I'm going to wait for a swordsman. We almost have enough to be able to one-shot this guy, but... Now again, we're going to take a hit of six when this unit moves into place. Oh, but they... Nuts! I was not expecting them to do that. Okay. Well, we are going to heal up in the woods, so we're safe there. Um... I'm going to end the turn. I do actually want to put down a Tribal Priestess if I can. Oh, wait. I think I'm going to get taken out. Yeah, because then they move and that nukes the, uh, the Swordsman. But I can prevent them from moving. And the Tribal Priestess, five health. I don't really need them for the attack. So again, this is largely about um, making sure that the shrine is giving us the, uh, or the shrine's having as much time as possible to sort of boost my, my health. Um, <clears throat> we do really need the health at this point, so I'm just going to end the turn. And the next thing we want to take a look at is um, what... Uh, what we're up against. Okay, so this is, yeah, this is gonna be a really tough fight. So, um, this unit moves before the elf. Ugh. I'm gonna wait the one turn, actually.
Okay, now that actually works rather well for me, so I'm going to put a swordsman in place here. So I want to avoid engaging this unit as uh, long as possible. Now the drawback is eventually they're going to make it, and they've got a whole forest to sort of build their health in. But ideally, I'm only going to deal with one like enemy at a time, and we do enough damage to take them out this turn. So last thing I'm going to do is the orc. I, I wish it was slightly better, but we're just going to try and buff people as much as possible to deal with the inevitable uh, showdown. Oh, he didn't give the buff I wanted. That's super bad. Okay. Okay. I'm deploying the sorceress for two reasons. One, I want to heal my shrine, and two, that's also going to give some health to the swordsman, who's going to get stronger and stronger each turn. So it would have been nice to minimize the damage that the shrine takes, but we know we win this turn, so... So, I mean, it's interesting. I'm a little surprised. Like, it, if you think about it, there's not a whole lot for me to have learned here, right? There's, um, you know, a set of skills. Uh, it's pretty clear that there's a quite a bit more depth to this than I'd thought. I will confess one spot that I'm struggling with a little bit is because I don't control where the units go, and I don't seem to have a really reliable way of predicting where the units... Like, I don't have a, a pretty reliable way of predicting what they're about to do. Um, you'll notice that when it came to the Orc Warlord, like, that was useless. If anything, it wound up helping the enemy because I spent two mana to basically give them a, a direct train ride to the uh, to the shrine. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one thing I think I'm going to need to develop a little bit of an understanding for. Um, but I'm intrigued and just even with this very small number of combinations, like it's clear that there's quite a bit of variety in here and there's quite a bit of thinking that I need to do in order to get the best outcomes. So we'll see how far I can, I can make it on this run. Okay, so that's 88 uh, ether and 20 fire energy. Okay, boss fight. Broken island. How this island came to be shattered in the first place, no one knows. Or perhaps they choose not to say. So, I can go to the merchant again. I can go to the chamber to acquire talents using elemental energies. I can go to the forge to merge sparks of creation into gems. Let me just make sure. Yeah, so we don't have any sparks of creation. Um, but it might be so there's a side of me that says well merchant right that's something we know how to work with but that's not like that's not the fun option you know the fun option is to explore and see what new things there are um, so in this case let's go to the chamber to see if uh, what these talents are Chamber. Uh, the chamber stores the memories of every god that has ever been born into this world. Use energy to learn from them and obtain their powers. Now, I'm curious when they talk about every god that has been born into this world, I wonder if this is something that you can use to sort of bring things back from previous playthroughs. Clearly, that's not going to be true now because this is my first playthrough. But... Um, I, I am interested in, in whether, if that's kind of what they're talking about in terms of gods that have been born into this world, or if this is just simply a reference that, you know, there used to be a god of, you know, fire and wood and, and death, uh, and, um, you know, you're the only one left, so. Okay, so the only thing we've got the power for would be fire, 
Um, and it seems that it doesn't actually... Huh. So I guess this is a way to convert uh, ether into the element. It's interesting to see, so it doesn't actually say what any of these talents are. Uh, so it may not be like, what What do I know about fire talents? Maybe, maybe the wood talents are the awesome ones, but let's click it, learn it. Okay, so I can choose between veteran, adds plus seven, plus two to the first summoned ally each battle. That seems pretty strong for a swordsman. Alternatively, we can do Flame of Vengeance upon an ally's death, adds plus two attack on all the other allies. So if instead I want to... Hmm. This is actually kind of neat because if I sort of swarm with a lot of expendable units... Um, yeah, I like this. Uh, so I suppose the question would be, do I want to spend some to... Let's try unlocking. Actually, I'm not going to have enough. Oh, I am! Why not? Uh, grants dual wield to every third summoned ally. Let's see what that means. Uh, attacks an additional time. Or panic when allies attack three times in total, all enemies will lose minus three attack. Time for a boss fight. Talvius damages the shrine with basic attacks from any distance. The Undefeated Knight. Okay, so as always, uh, we need to choose where to put our shrine. So as it said, um, launches a project. Oh yeah, launches a projectile dealing six damage to the shrine. It's also worth noting here on attack, it grants plus eight health to this unit if the target is weaker. So I actually only want to be bringing things that have. Um, I only want to be bringing things that have got eight attack or more after this guy. War Graveyard on enter. If the entered unit is Talvius, add plus four attack to him. Okay, so I also need to keep this. I need to keep this guy out of these fields. Now, one way I could do that would be to go inside the forest. The thing is, is that proximity to Talvius doesn't actually seem to be that big of a problem because he's going to wind up attacking me no matter what. I mean, it's six damage to the shrine, so that's something I want to keep in mind. But, like, the idea of him standing in a swamp attacking me is actually kind of attractive. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put that shrine down. I'm also going to start... Oh, God, I don't know if my swordsman's going to... I'm going to start him off here and pray that he goes to this slot. Good. So we're not actually going to use him for health. We're going to put the place of power down. And that's going to be the way, the sneaky way that I uh, I um, make him uh, not heal the enemy. So it's a pretty high risk strategy here, right? That I'm moving moving the shrine so close to the enemy at the start here. But I'm trying to I'm trying to play sort of to the fight. Oh, hang on, because the shrine also counts as something that'll... I think I just lost... Okay, so I'm going to put a healer down to try and augment the shrine for a bit. No, you fool! It's 
So at this point, I'm just trying to put as much healing as I can and, and hope that the, uh, the swordsman's going to be able to do their thing in time. Uh, we only get one more turn of this. So there's going to be some um, there's going to be some improvements to damage that happen this turn, but I don't think we have enough to be able to um, to to um, pull myself out of the fire. I feel like there were some good ideas in in terms of how I approached this, but I didn't fully appreciate like the implications of of what I was doing. Yeah, so we don't even survive the, the initial attack. No, you definitely don't get to control the, uh, the units in this. All right, so we've faced our, uh, faced our, our, first, um, our first loss. So obliterate humankind October 11th in early access. Oh, I'm so I completely uh, tagged the wrong, the wrong account. Um, it's a play godless. All right, get experience as a reward after each match. Purchase, purchase useful goods for experience in the library and play on higher difficulties to get even more experience. Okay, cool. So this is intended to be sort of run through over and over again. So, um, Divine Speed won one battle uh, in 15 turns or less. Two continents destroyed. Cool. All right. Um, I don't have a ton of time to stream tonight, um, so I want to be a little conscious of uh, of the time that I have. But let's let's definitely do another run of Godless and see where this goes. Uh, click the locks to obtain these boons. So skill mastery: the boon is inactive. So increase the number of available skill slots from four to five. Increase the number of available skill slots. To, okay. Um, claim an extra reward after achieving victory on a continent. And it doesn't... Okay, so let's start with skill mastery. Oh. Let's upgrade one of the seized boons to obtain its benefits. And I don't have the uh, resources for any anymore. Sure thing. So this interests me. The idea of progress over the different runs, I didn't, I didn't. I mean, again, it's. I know that's a roguelike thing, but it wasn't what I was expecting. So this, I'm quite interested now. Um, I mean, maybe I was playing easy before. Let's try and uh, bump this up to normal. Let's see if we can do. Let's see if we can have a better showing this time around. Okay, so we kind of know some of the basics of what we're up against. Um, we are going to have to deal with exploding ogres, which I don't have a good reply to yet. Um, but we managed to get by the first time, so let's see how we do. The one thing that I do want to walk away with uh, this time around is a healthier shrine than the last time. Oh, interesting. What are these? Ancient rune. Add plus one health to the shrine. Yeah, okay. Um, I feel I kind of have to start with the swordsman at this point. Ah, you fool! I wanted him to move on to the tile here. Uh, 
Uh, and actually, this was the worst possible start I could have given myself because that tribal priestess is going to give the uh, this enemy unit a direct line to um, to the shrine. Or maybe not. Maybe that's a skill that they learn after. Okay. Lucky me, I guess. Um, I think we're going to wait for the other swordsman at this point. Now, it'd be nice if I could do something to preserve their life, but I don't think that's going to be happening, so... No! I wanted to put him there! Ugh. So he's going to wind up walking into the swamp. That's That actually is a little annoying. Um... Because, like, that's the difference between having a, uh, an 8 attack uh, and 6 health, an extra health for my shrine and six and three when facing the ogre. But um, I guess we can give you one of these. I wonder if they're all gonna race to go into the swamp. It's a very different setup from what I was planning this to be, but... Okay, so now I need to worry about exploding ogres and um, direct teleports to, to deadly places. Uh, this is going to suck in particular... I'm not 100% sure how I feel about this, but... So I'm going to move. This guy's going to get blown up by the moving ogre, but they're going to be able to survive into the next... No, because then the ogre's going to attack them, I think. Nope, maybe not. Okay. But... <laughs> that happened. Okay, so we got to end the turn... So the reason why I passed the turn without adding anyone is that I'm going to have a swordsman that will be able to do double damage, uh, which is my next best in that scenario. You know what the funny thing is? I didn't use any of those scrolls that I had in my inventory. I don't think that would have solved anything, but it's probably something I should have kept in mind. Okay, now I do want to leave the option open for a unit to move into this to heal up my shrine. And what I'm going to do is I'm also going to add the uh, priest. I'm thinking because the health uh, carries over from continent to continent, I probably do want to start bringing some priestesses around my shrine to just sort of help augment the, the health each turn if I don't have a better option. Okay, so we're going to have, as long as the priestesses don't go attacking, uh, we will have people who are stronger than the elf. I don't want to know about the... But yeah, it's still on attack teleports to the shrine. So unless I somehow wind up with a lot more damage than I currently have, that's still going to be a thing. Um, but I can get another priestess.
This does also limit what the uh, the elf can do in terms of movement. So it seems a little wasteful to have this many priestesses running around, but given that there's an enemy that's going to be doing six damage as soon as they move next to one of my uh, my soldiers, and the fact that my soldiers have becoming have basically been getting stronger each turn, uh, it's not the worst thing in the world to be investing in that health, and it it's translating into something that I um, I'm able to take into the future turns with me. So originally where I had no use for the tribal priestesses, they're now like my new favorite unit. Although I think there's going to be consequences for the swordsman. <laughs> Definitely pri priestesses. <laughs> The funny thing, too, is that by spamming priestesses, um, if I get one of those talents again that, um, you know, gives bu uh, buffs when a unit dies, um, that's also going to be a big, uh, big improvement. Okay, so one thing that's going to suck is this unit is going to walk into this tile and die. I'm still going to focus on healing my shrine, though. They may actually may wind up healed uh, by a unit beforehand, now that I think of it. So then that just means that they die to the ogre attack. Nope, they don't get healed. <laughs> it's just a big old sad turn. I probably should have been able to tell that by looking at the turn order, actually, but... So I'm just gonna I'm gonna sort of trust the soup uh, on this one. I, I, there's gonna be a lot of people who die, but in this case, I'm gonna be I want to invest in my uh, my shrine's health because I've got a big I've got a big swordsman not just with a high uh, attack, but with a pretty pretty terrifying amount of health uh, as a result of being surrounded by priestesses as well. I suppose the one drawback is is that I'm not going to get the experience for uh, ending the fight quickly. They're doing a good job of ev evading the swordsman that's going to cause them problems, but like I said, the the fact that I, I win by waiting, basically, um, is not really giving me an incentive to, to hasten the, uh, the ogre's demise. So we won't we won't finish the I don't think we'll finish the battle with over a hundred health, but 
considerably stronger position than when we <laughs> when we first tried this. What a shame we can't take our summons with us. Okay. Uh, 92, 5, and 10. It's only one ogre to deal with this time, but the fact that we have all of these uh, sorceresses to deal with is probably going to involve some some hard choices. Let's uh, buy some goodies. I'll probably wind up picking up the scrolls again. But yeah, so this one I'm gonna have to be uh, I'm gonna have to be wary of uh, sudden teleportation to to my shrine. Oh, they're all over the place. Um, The drawback is, is I can't put a place of power anywhere nearby. At least not without giving up the thing that I want uh, this unit to be able to take advantage of. Now remember, uh, this unit is going to be able to uh, teleport to the shrine as soon as they attack. Um, I think I'm going to end the turn so I can summon another swordsman. Okay, that's not great that they are... Um... Okay, so unfortunately I am going to have to wind up healing the swordsmen so that they can properly deal with the sorceress. And I think here... I suspect they're just going to move to their death. But I'll try and get a little more healing for the shrine. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so this is more or less going to take care of itself now. I do want uh, stronger swordsmen uh, coming in, so I'm going to save up. We're going to have to deal with an ogre reasonably soon, and we don't have that much healing yet. So I'm going to start my swordsmen uh, in a place where they can get some extra strength. Okay, so uh, I am going to want to think a little bit about how I can improve the strength of my allies. Now, places of power beside my shrine, that might be a double-edged sword. For all I know, the enemy winds up um, stronger as a result. Well, the thing is, though, if I don't make this unit stronger... Okay, I'm going to risk it. The reason I want to risk it here is because I know I'm going to be attacking this elf right away. Um, so if I can get a little extra damage in before, I want to take advantage of it. So again, we kind of knew that was going to happen. Okay. 
Okay, so I'm not crazy about swamps. In this case, this is more about protecting the health of that unit. Although, in fairness, we are going to wind up with a couple of pretty strong units uh, to make the make the enemy miserable with. Good lord! <laughs> Never met a swamp they didn't want to visit. So I was hoping to summon a priestess so that we could do the same trick with the shrine, but... Now, biggest problem here is that both of these units are ripe for... Yep, there it goes. I think the one saving grace, though, is that this unit's just going to keep pounding my... Uh, is just going to keep pounding my shrine for the next little while. So I am sort of putting all my eggs in one basket by summoning the priestess and just relying on this one soldier here. Um... I'll do this one more time, and then we'll see the state of play. Oh, that's right. We have to deal with the nasty sorceresses. Okay. So part of this... Well, I guess my units are going to move anyway, but I was going to say part of this is about making sure that this slot is open so that the sorceress may wind up in this area. We'll see how it turns out, though. Either way, whichever unit gets attacked is dead. So we don't have the mana for a swordsman, so we're just going to wait out the turn. I'm trying to decide if the Swordsman's the right call, or if we do another Tribal Priestess. Because it's going to take us a while to to get where we need to go. Um, where are they headed? Okay. So I'm going to put a Swordsman here, hoping that they take advantage of the other place of power. It's also clear that the enemy units do not get the advantage of place of power, so... That's good news. Oh, well, that? Okay. Wasn't quite expecting that. But... I have enough to dedicate myself to a bunch of priestesses. Obviously, letting this unit sort of stick there and um, keep hammering away on my shrine isn't ideal. We're definitely doing worse as far as health is concerned, but I think my swordsmen will eventually... Oh, no, they're not eventually going to make their way there. Okay, so I actually need to take a break, um, because even with four priestesses, I'm going to lose this race. I need a swordsman in place to be able to deal some serious damage, and I should have done that much earlier. But then they decide to move in a different direction. Ugh. Give myself two priestesses then. Oh, but then they don't get to heal anyway. All right. So that could have gone better. I mean, we were a bit worse off, but uh, the real question now is uh, if we're on to the boss fight, what do I try and pick up with the... Uh, 
We'll go back to the chamber. Um, in this case, I think the first summon is going to be a bit more important. Oh, I had more than I thought. Uh, can I actually get 30? Not a chance. But I can probably get five. Grants regeneration to a chosen ally on turn three, or creates two sacred groves on the battle start. I like stuff that I can choose. So I don't know if this is really going to be... I don't know if this is going to be the combination of things that I need to be able to take out um, the boss. But I think we're coming in with a little bit of a better, a better picture of what's required. So there's definitely a lot of sense uh, in not going close to Talvis. Recreate continent. No, I mean, this is all of this stuff. You know, that I could be in a worse spot, right? Like, <laughs> there's not that many places for him to get, uh, get some extra attack. Now, I'm definitely going to need to bring more swordsmen to the fight, or alternatively, creating places of power. That makes them heal. But there aren't that many more people they can bully. So I think I'm going to wait. So the hard part here is going to be to try and survive all the... Oof! That I wasn't expecting but we still have enough to be able to push uh, push them over the edge. So I'm going to wait a turn on this. Because if I can fight them in the swamp here, then we've won. Yeah, no, that's not happening. Um, now I'm wasting... Uh, I'm wasting mana if I... Um, if I don't deploy something. This is a contingency plan. I basically want to get them a bunch of health while these two do their thing. Thank you for the health. So now I put down a place of power that's going to be twice because we're going to be following after our enemy. But we only need one attack to be able to get the boss. Oh, and we still got a divine speed. Cool. All right. Three continents destroyed, uh, 200 units and tiles created, two talents learnt. Uh, and because we were um, we we're playing on normal, we got a 100% modifier, so we can head back to the library. 
Um, but I can't afford... <laughs> I can't afford anything in here. Um, all right, well, we'll unlock the talents at least. Oh, no, we've got some basics that we can work with. So we can get rituals. Uh, the boon is inactive. Upgrade it to see its benefits. Perform powerful rituals mid-battle to crush an uh, enemies and aid allies. Uh, and then number two, unlock ultimate rituals with especially strong effects. Or... Uh, enhanced stone the boon is inactive okay so increase the shrine starting health from 40 to 45 40 to 50 40 to 55 40 to 60 so i have a feeling if it hasn't been found already that that thing that i did earlier with the priestesses is a very good way to boost the initial um the initial health of the starting shrine and i sort of feel like that overrides the kinds of advantages that you might get from that boon. On the other hand, if you're in a situation where you've got some points to spend, and maybe you don't want to spend all of those early turns trying to to boost this up. I mean, again, if you're if you're spending those turns, that is uh, time that you're not getting the experience. Um, but yeah, in terms of where I want to be spending my points, I feel like the rituals uh, are a bit more attractive. And then the question is, do I spend or save? And I think in this case, we'll spend recklessly. So uh, I was kind of planning on finishing around 8 o'clock. So it does actually turn out that I have to do a bit of a shorter stream. But would you like to see one more one more round of this? Because I'm, I'm not opposed to doing that uh, by, any, by any stretch of the imagination. I actually also should take a minute here and just see if anybody is playing Godless to see if there's somebody that we could host uh, after we're done. But yeah, okay. I'm glad that there's some, I mean, part of it is just a, it feels so needy when you ask like, hey, are you guys having fun? Um, right? It's like that can sometimes sound like you want people to participate in chat or you, you know, you're not sure if the game is fun. <laughs> Um, but I, I do like it when people are like, yeah, <laughs> hit him again. Um, so I also, uh, again, I, I do have quite a bit that I need to get through tonight, but that doesn't mean, um, that doesn't mean that I, uh, I, I'm completely ignoring the, the stream. So, um, and again, I was originally intending on trying to go for the full length, but that was before. So basically, just to be clear on what happened, so I had a meeting today. There was an outside chance that I was going to get a chance to do something really cool. Um, and uh, it was always a little bit of a flyer that it was going to happen, um, just in the sense that I... I'm trying to think of like the right way to put it. Like... Um, it was very, very short notice, and I had to do something... Okay, well, I, I can talk a little bit about it. Um, I had to get my passport, and for those of you who've looked this... Uh, Vanguard Master will know what I'm talking about, but... Um, but uh, in terms of... In Canada, be, uh, because the COVID restrictions are kind of going down, I think people are are sort of back to feeling like like life's back to normal whether or not it is i'm not going to like give a a hard opinion on on that but because people are acting like it um you know they need to do now the thing is is that um i have had a passport at some point in my life but it was long ago that it doesn't exist in the government records <laughs> so um Anyways, like it definitely, I, I got early, early notification that this thing could happen. And I had to tell them as like, honestly, I do not know if I'm going to be able to, to, um, you know, to, to do this thing. Um, but I did find out that in like emergencies and urgent situations, uh, there is a special procedure. And apparently I was a really marginal case. Like I didn't have what they needed. But I I sort of gave some supporting documentation. I said, it's like halfway. So it's like, here, do this written declaration, which I did. And I was like, that's now you're now you're the full way. So um, but then the problem is, is that the people I was talking to, like, it's one thing to make a, you know, make an offer or, or talk about doing something, you know, back in August. Um, it's a whole other thing, like 
in such short notice um, to, you know, have some guy come out and say, hey, guess what? My password's working now. So, um, so you know, I, again, I know I, a lot of people are like really ripping into Service Canada right now. Um, yeah, Vanguard, I mean, I was under the impression that there was a special military passport anyway. So like if you had to go, um, you you would be given like a special one. Um, cause I believe there's one, like there's obviously the diplomatic passport and then I think for like, I don't think it's the same one, but I think there's a special one for like people who need to go to conferences as part of their work. I was under the impression there's like a special colored passport, which is not like, you know, is not the same, like what you usually want is just like your own, but there is, but, uh, it is given to those that need it and taken away when you come back. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I should have, I should have had one forever, but like, the thing is, is that again, I'm so close. I, there's a couple things that knock back my progress, but like this year I'm finally putting away the last of the school debt. And the good news is, is that all of that debts on a 0% balance transfer rate. Right. So I like, I don't need to, um, I don't need to worry about like the rising interest rates, but it's really clear that I still want to be on track to paying that debt off because the cost of carrying that debt is considerably higher than it was when I first sort of made that last effort to sort of slay it. And that milestone and like maybe getting a promotion at work, which is sometimes looks like it's kind of remote. Um, those would be the sorts of things that are like when I would feel like I need a passport. <laughs> Bless your heart, Mad King Brutus. Thank you very much for uh, the Prime subscription. Oh boy, have you been drowning in government paperwork recently? I feel you. Yeah, I. Um, it's not fun. <laughs> But like I said, the Service Canada, this, P, Service Canada has really been getting ripped into by people. I have to say, yes, the wait was long. Um, it's very frustrating to be told a service standard and not have that service standard be met. My individual experience was very reasonable in a situation where their guidelines would have told them that it would have been okay to inconvenience me. Um, and I, I like that the agent I was dealing with was enabled to overcome what se something that seemed like an unjust outcome in a situation where it easily could have gone the other way. Um, but, uh, but yeah, one way or the other, I'm, I'm very happy that it, uh, you know, that it turned out. Um, like I said, I put myself a little bit on the back foot of uh, cost wise, but I think it's going to be worth it. Uh, and obviously, you know, first time I'm going to be traveling outside of the country in, you know, over a decade. So, um, Vagar Master, the very coveted green passport you get when you get deployed. Is it covered? What, what coveted? Or, or is that like, are you saying coveted ironically? Um, most Americans, you know, don't have passports, but here in Europe, you feel like everyone has got one. Yeah, Index Gnome. So it's funny. I was actually talking with the person who had sort of invited me about... I'm sorry I'm delaying the start of the game, but I, I figured it's better to talk about this now than in the middle of a playthrough. So I was talking with... Um, I was talking with uh, one of the people who was organizing this thing. Like, it's a, it's a gaming and influencer related thing. Um... And again, you'll 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 see videos of it. Like, don't worry. But I I need to um, I need to get myself uh, kind of I need to get myself organized and like it's be it, I always think it's better to just show the thing rather than like tease it forever. Very coveted because it's uh, more powerful than the regular one. Oh, gotcha. Um, right. Okay. I gotcha. Gotcha. Um, oh yeah, I'll bet Vanguard because I guess like Service Canada covers a, a huge. Um, a huge range of activities but yeah so they were talking about this and they they sort of said um you know it is common to sort of joke about the americans and i suppose by extension the canadians so let's say the north americans but like the thing is is that the countries are so large that there's actually a lot to see without needing a passport um, and to cover the same geography, I suppose, as Algren's points out, you know, the closer borders. But, 
you know, like there's just so many more. Like, I, I, it feels like to a certain extent, I expect if you were moving between states or provinces, um, you'd probably be even traveling a greater distance than some countries in Europe. Like, I'm pretty sure to cross the Benelux, that might not even cover the the distance of... Um, I, again, I don't know the full geography, but it wouldn't surprise me um, if like that was a smaller area than crossing one of the Canadian provinces. Um, width wise, of course, like you, if you go up north, like usually the provinces are quite tall, but like nobody goes up there. <laughs> usually you go up there if you're a natural resource ext ext uh, extraction. So, but I mean, like, to be honest, it is one of the, there's two things that I would really like to do. And I feel I've not adequately done yet. And one, I would like to properly learn a second language. And I'm working on French, but I have few fewer occasions to sort of use it. And the type of French that I know is not consistent with the way that I would normally want to talk. Uh, and then the other one would be to be more traveled because there's a lot of interesting things in the world. And obviously I have some, you know, I'd say reasonably broad interest. Maybe it's not obvious if I have to say reasonably, but I'd, I'd say I have some fairly broad interests. Uh, and you know traveling sort of feels like one of these things i should have done earlier um but like if you think of it like you know the time i've been spending you know quite a bit of work um a lot of school uh, you know the time sort of adds up so um it's it's nice to finally kind of get some of that real life stuff handled Google Rainbow Lake to see where that is. Okay, now I got to see. You also have vacations in here. Yeah, I actually have been, I, you know, it's common to complain about work. Well, Index Gnome doesn't complain about work. Well, maybe you do, but um, I don't think you complain about bosses. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I actually, if anything, I've probably... Um, I've probably banked up too much vacation time. So it's, it's more on me that I've, um, it's more on me that I've, I've, uh, I've, um, I've not taken that vacation time. Minimum five weeks vacation. Wow. That's, that's cool. Yeah. I, I definitely prefer like fewer big vacations rather than just like eating up a couple of days here and there. Cause like, all I'm going to do is like catch up on some sleep, maybe get a little reading in. And all of a sudden it's like I had, you know, a weekend. Um, a Whistler. I, I hold on. I think I this might have been one of the last places I worked in a movie. Those days are awesome because they either have to pay you for the travel, which is a lot, or they have to put you up in a hotel. And usually for people like me, they don't want to put me up in a hotel, so they just pay through the nose. Um, yeah, because like on one of the last, like we knew that we knew the show was going to go uh, like, OK, this will be the last story I tell before I go through. We knew the show was going to be canceled. Like it, that was just obvious. Um. And normally what happens is if you do a role, so like if I pulled focus, even for one shot, it would be treated as if I was a focus puller the full day, which is a, a pretty big pay bump. And like if you are a camera operator, that's a lot of money. Um, so like if you shoot one shot, you're a camera operator, you get paid the whole day as a camera operator, but chances are you're working as like a first or a second for the for the day um and those are 18 hour days so 18 hours on a camera operator salary that is a really really good day um and you know the people in the department they knew who i was they knew what my interests were and we're basically out sort of shooting some footage to use for like cutaways and stuff like that and for those of you that haven't been to whistler it's beautiful i believe uh, a version of windows was actually codenamed whistler because the microsoft team like spending time up there but what was great about it was like it was just you know three people in a camera crew bunch of film big expensive camera going out shoot shooting beautiful scenery 
cap like you know we're setting up the shot i've got my you know, slate ready to go and stuff like that camera operator kind of gestures to me it's like do you want to want to do the shot i was like sure it's like and he's like you can't tell anyone that you did i'm like no i want to do it so it's like you know so he, you know, in that case, he stops setting up the camera. He's like, okay. You know, so he's like, you know, at this point, I'm getting to pick, like, where I'm aiming at, what I'm doing. He obviously wanted to take a quick look through the lens to, like, see, did I, like, point it at the ground? Am I, you know, is, is this actually something that is going to be useful or not? You know, took a look, you know, asked a couple questions. Um, you know, why why'd you choose to do this and on and so forth. But yeah, like, I got the... I got a chance. And it, like, again, it's like full on, like awesome Panavision. I think it was a Panavision and Millennium um, XL, you know, big thousand foot mag on it. Um, the Vision 3 stock wasn't out yet, but we were, I think it was like using whatever the new Vision 2 was at the time. Like, you know, I, I was easily using uh, over a million dollars of film equipment. Um, I actually think we had Cook Primes on that too. So those were nice lenses. Um, but um but yeah, no, that was uh, I got a chance to you know set up and, and shoot a shoot a nice uh, a nice shot in Whistler um, to uh, you know as as I guess kind of compensation for the fact that I was going to be unemployed for the next few months. Um, anyways, um, miss your old job. Three weeks vacation. Used to take October off. Uh, then Petco bought out the company and dissolved it. Oh, sorry to hear that. And Brudos, in regards to so much you see in countries, Australia is the same. It's uh, 1,800 kilometers to a town. It's literally intersected by the state border. I know um, Cheese was actually going over this on his channel, just showing, like, where he is. And even, I mean, he's in Tasmania, so it's not like that's a large place. But um, he was showing a few places on, on the, well, where he walks. But, like, more importantly, he just kind of moved up and and uh, started showing like where he grew up and um, you know it was just sort of showing uh, showing the vast distances between sort of where he grew up and like a place that meant something to him and, and so on anyways back to godless let's see if we can take out the so I wonder what it takes to unlock oh no it's okay no so act two is locked I wonder what it takes to unlock hard. Hit enemies that are adjacent to shrine will attack it no matter what. Okay, that doesn't change anything. Interesting. So I'm trying to decide if this tile or this tile makes more sense. Because it's only ever going to be two enemies that are attacking me. Both of them leave the other forest as an option. I'll put it here. I'm going to wait before I put down the place of power because a lot of these things work to my advantage. So it's possible that I'm going to cross into the swamp next turn. Okay, so I've been caught a couple of times about what the movement patterns are going to be. So I'm going to move into the swamp here. They're going to move on to this tile. Okay, so I don't want to intervene this turn, but I do want to intervene next turn. Although it might have been smarter for me to put the swordsman down. So I'm going to clear the swamp for myself there. And I'm going to get a swordsman instead of get a healer, but I do also want to start putting down some healers.
Although, because I, I haven't really given myself a lot of options in terms of um, healing. Um, I'll start the healer off here. I know that doesn't help the shrine, but I do want this unit to get augmented. So again, as always, it's worth remembering as soon as this unit attack, or maybe they don't. I always want to treat it like these units when they um, when they attack, they're going to be heading to my shrine next. Uh, here I want to empower the unit, one, to prevent the damage, but number two, also to help them uh, gain the strength advantage versus the sorceress. And then I might consider uh, putting down some of my priestesses to help out with the shrine. Although I'm probably going to wind up in a swamp, so maybe I want to uh, strengthen this unit instead. Depends where the enemies deploy. So this guy's almost certainly going to be blowing up uh, as soon as he moves in. So sunken land, destroy a hex completely. Um, storm wind, create three gales. Pushes units in the direction of the wind, inactive until the next wave. Oh, this is this is cheating. Um, don't I get to pick? I don't get it. What? Shouldn't that? I was thinking it would like knock it off the edge of the continent. Um, okay, so where's this thing going to move? Yeah, so we're going to move here, and he's going to blow us up as soon as he moves in. In fact, that's going to take out everyone. Um, I don't think there's a lot I can do to prevent that, to be honest. Um, the one thing I can hope for is this priestess healing. Well, we knew that was coming. Brutal. Yeah, and I totally would not have done... Like, this didn't seem to do anything. So we are really in trouble now. I'm going to end the turn. They're going to be able to heal up, unfortunately. So I'm starting my swordsman here because they need to accumulate power over time, but I want them to be coming in a little bit stronger in terms of uh, health. Okay, not ideal, but I'll make it work. And again, I want to I want to build another swordsman, so I'm going to give it a turn and then we move. Oh wow, they're really going after the shrine. Good news is we're going to be able to take out this ogre uh, this turn. Bad news is I'm not sure what we do about this one. Oh, you betrayed me! Brutal. That could not have gone worse. <laughs> the good news is Swordsman's going to be able to knock out both of them in one, one shot, but... I was hoping we would have sort of super soldiers for the sorceresses. That's obviously not happening, though. 
Oh, Jesus. Um, ally of your choice devours all adjacent tiles and gains their stats? Or I can relocate a unit. I have no idea what that did. Oh, I guess it's if they're beside when a enemy spawned? Um, anyway. This is as good as we can hope for. I think I'm just going to wait for another swordsman at this point. Oh, they were supposed to... They were supposed to be the one that that <laughs> got the, the, the buff. All right. Definitely not doing my parade of priestesses next next time. Okay, I'm actually pretty happy that they wound up going in the woods. I'm not sure that's going to help me with the attacks, though. Okay. So I think at this point it makes sense for me to keep uh, deploying priestesses to just try and get a little more uh, a little more life out of the or into the shrine. I should feel pretty secure in my position now. Right. Horrible. <laughs> uh, okay, this is going to take a little longer than I was thinking. <laughs> so at four damage that we do this turn, we'll lose nine. Now, one thing that's interesting about this, uh, I don't believe there's a way that I can remove these followers. Uh, so I think I'm sort of stuck with them no matter what, um, which means that this knight's actually going to have a bit of a journey. So with that in mind, one thing I don't want to do is take a priestess and uh, like put her here. Although I think this unit dies no matter what. Yeah, because the priestesses do a total of four damage. Nope, they die to the swamp, but that should mean the swordsman moves into position to deliver the coup de grace. So I'm going in uh, 69 health. I leave it to chat to show restraint with that number. Also, um, Night King Brutus, how have you been? Um, I don't know if you've been streaming lately. I definitely haven't caught it if you have. Um, but uh, I'm very happy to see you again. Okay, so I can buy at the merchant. I can... I think probably merchant makes the most sense at the start. Um... I probably should have considered it. Like, I haven't really been doing anything with... Uh... I haven't been doing anything with these skills, and I feel like I probably should be um, experimenting. Let's see how we handle Antarctic Kingdom this time. Okay. So I suppose the usual dilemma is, do I... So I'm I'm intrigued by how I had this view that tucking the shrine in a corner was always the best choice. 
And yet we've seen that there can be situations where you surround your shrine with a bunch of people who are really good at healing it um, as a viable strategy. Also, the idea of surrounding it with swamp seems to be a pretty good one. Um, so with that in mind, like I do want to put it in, I was thinking of deploying it here, but I do want to put it in forest just to, to be able to gain the the health off of that. Oh, this is an interesting question. If I replace the mountains... No, but if I replace the mountains, then I don't get the health benefit. So that doesn't work. Um, yeah, I think this is still my best bet. Um... Now, where's this idiot going to walk? Good. <laughs> um, I was worried that they were going to go, like, march into the swamp. Uh, the only thing is that I kind of want them to have their... I want them to boost their strength before I go further. I don't know. We'll end the turn now. I'm going to have to take a point where I put down a place of power, but let's see how the turns wind up going. And the longer we keep this, the sorceress at bay, the happier I am. Hmm, double swordsman. Very strong strategy coming in. <laughs> to be fair, I was also prepping for the possibility that this, uh, that this guy would be blowing up when he walks. No, he's got unmoved damage, uh, damage enemies, so that's going to be hitting me soon. Um, let's start with this priestess. That's going to be a little extra healing for me. So I have enough to be able to survive both his explosion and the attack. Oh, it turns out that's not necessary. Now it is. All right, that wasn't exactly what I was expecting. Um, I genuinely do not know if he attacks the ogre or the sorceress. If he attacks the ogre, that's good. If he attacks the sorceress, that's bad. I think I'm just gonna wait. Okay, now the problem here is the sorceress attacks and then teleports. And they go to a place where they can heal! <laughs> so all that swamp is actually something that's now a liability for my people. Something I'm going to do to try and improve things is so start by making them stronger because that's going to that's going to go from six damage a turn to 16 damage a turn. Hey, Takree, good to see you again. Uh, I don't know if you saw the last um, Twitter message, but I'm I'm hoping the the intention was to share something that might be disappointing news uh, and to turn that into a yay. Okay, I actually think Vicious Hunger is going to be really interesting this time. <laughs> Behold, the ultimate knight! So that's 40 damage it does to every unit that it goes... Sorry, 44 damage it does to every unit that looks at it the wrong way. Um, as much as I would love to keep uh, um, to to keep charging this guy with more damage, I think healing the shrine is the more sensible thing to do here. Um, let's say that there is a higher degree of yeah. Let's say there's a higher degree of certainty than when I originally messaged you. 
And yes, there will be a record of the uh, of the occurrence. Okay, so I think we're gonna do our usual kind of cornball strategy here and overload on priestesses until. I mean, one thing that could happen if, for whatever reason, this unit attacks before, that might actually happen. So I think they're going to move in, then they're going to... No, never mind. Can I just keep that unit into the boss fight? Oh, that's right. We have, uh, we have more. Okay, destroy a hex completely. So, I'm not not allowed to not allowed to destroy the the hex where the the bad guy is. Okay. I don't know if I want to push. I guess putting gales around the shrine would be a good idea. Okay, let's see how this works. So this actually isn't enough to kill the ogre. And I have a sneaking suspicion that this unit's actually going to be able to move and teleport to the the shrine. Okay, so you can push them over the edge. Yeah, that's no good. So, um, I'm going to start by putting a priestess there. I actually should be saving up for a warrior now that I think of it, or a swordsman. And sadly, I've actually crowded out my swordsman from being able to deal with my, uh, deal with the um, problem. So one of the ways that I'm going to fix that... Okay, so there's two options that I have. I can either let this unit die to the swamp, uh, or I can supercharge them. And I prefer the idea of supercharging. So we've got two units to heal the shrine for... So it's basically net nine that I'm losing every turn. Um, the one bit of good news is, is that the priestesses are going to be getting stronger each turn. So next turn, we should be able to kill the sorceress. Yeah, I, I'm kind of thinking that, Index Gnome. I think the one cat... So let me just double check what you were saying. You're wondering if placing the shrine one out from the border so you can have a priest walk around it as they move forward is the better option. Yes, I think in general that's true. Um, although in practice when I did that, I don't seem to be able to summon en enough priests to to actually accomplish what it would seem like they do kind of seem to have a mind of their own and and um i i usually only wind up having like two or three healing it at any one time um but yeah that i i think i did i think i thought that but i didn't actually say this part when uh when i was talking about the way that my uh, i thought i always thought that being in the corner at the start was like always the default option and given given this sort of priestess nonsense that I'm doing, I definitely feel that there's more sense in even sometimes being in the middle um, for the very reason that you mentioned. Uh, especially because when you think of it, there's only two places. Like, so far for all of these areas, there's only ever been two enemies. So even if you're in the corner, there's usually going to be two hexes that, uh, that, will, um, that are accessible. So anyway... Um, I should probably be focusing on getting some powers. So the really strong starting unit 
Seems like a good start. Oh, interesting. I don't have any fire. So I might actually have to think. Upon an ally's death, all adjacent allies get three health. Of course, that strengthens the boss. So I think I'm going to have to settle for that. Yep. Close, but not quite what I needed. I also don't think I'm going to have enough. Yeah, I don't think I have enough for anything. So if they're at the same exchange rate, I'm, I'm just one shy from... Oh, hang on. When eight allies die, the attack of a chosen unit is set to zero. Oh, man. That's such a high-risk strategy. I'm actually going to try this. This this is a completely banana strategy that I'm going to try here, but I'm actually going to suicide a bunch of units into the boss this time. Eight units is a lot to give up, but uh, if entered unit is Talvis, give him plus four attack. Okay, so the one thing I want to do, I want to avoid situations where he can walk over the graveyard. So I think I am going to try regenerating the continent this time. The last time we got a real gift as far as the... Ugh! That's not necessarily any better, but... It may be enough. Okay, so like I said, this this is going to be an utterly bananas strategy. <laughs> oh, hang on. Yes. Denied. All right. So I'm going to take six damage each time this guy attacks me with, uh, with a sword. But I think you might see where this is going. I might have screwed this up, though, given the fact that he's always going to be moving forward. I think he's not going to care about these priestesses. Oh, hang on, he's going to wind up walking on this tile instead. Damn it, I didn't think that through. Oh, never mind. So it just occurred to me, I don't have a way of killing the eight. Damn it, I just, I just lost. There's no way I can kill five units in enough time. I don't think there's a way of resetting the fight either, because it's a roguelike. <laughs> All right. Um, best I can hope for is just to supercharge my people, but... But he's going to be doing uh, 17 damage a turn, so... So yeah, I don't see a, I don't see a situation where I'm able to kill units. Um, so 
So yeah, the, the smarter thing to do would have been to put the shrine far enough away that... Um, So basically, I had to put the shrine far enough away that I could stick eight priestesses in front of the, in front of the boss, so then he could chain, uh, chain the priestesses, each turn. Um, so I'll skip a turn so I can summon a swordsman. But again, we're kind of going through the motions here. It's not. Uh, I'm not going to be able to to outpace what's what's about to happen. It is kind of, it is interesting though to sort of see, I, I wish I was better at learning before the disaster happens, but it is actually kind of neat to see how this learning happens. So I'm definitely gaining a better understanding of, of how to get the most out of this game. And like, in this case, it's a pure race, right? Like, had I started this turn with more health, you can see how this would have turned into some kind of a win. Um, because we're we're adding the you know we're adding the damage at a pretty considerable rate, and he's only ever going to be focusing on that shrine. Um, but unfortunately, we um, we brought in the damage too much. Again, I was relying too much on the priestesses dying um, to be able to um, to let me set his damage to zero. And because that didn't realize uh, that wasn't realized, we uh, we fell. But I do think that's going to be something I can try in future. Uh, and we got another Divine Speed and Terraformer. So we'll go to the library. I don't know if there's anything for me to pick up, but well, more starting health. That's a nice start. But yeah, that was Godless. And actually, I'm not that far off from the time that I normally would have. Um, I normally would have been wrapping wrapping things up. I was actually going to see if I could go into the office late tonight, but I think I'm just going to work on my laptop at home. But I do have a lot of work that I need to get through, so I am sorry to end uh, what is effectively a half hour earlier. I realize for a lot of you that this is going to be quite a bit earlier than what you were expecting because I started an hour earlier. Um, but uh, I do, I do want to try and put myself in a good spot in work before... Um, I don't know, like, I, f I feel like I need a win and kind of like a reset uh, at work. And the sooner I can I can have that happen, the better. Now, I'm going to take a quick second here and see if there's anybody doing Godless uh, or some of the other ones that I might be interested in. Actually, one thing I will ask you. So there's someone I was thinking of hosting, but I noticed that uh, Brace Yourself Games is still streaming tonight. So... I've got someone who is playing a game right now, um, and if you want to know what the game is, I, I'm happy to, um, I'm happy to tell you. Um, but if you would like to see the publisher of this game, um, they are uh, currently doing an art stream, which I think might be kind of nice to share. I seem to be the only one doing Godless right now, so not a lot I can do about that. And maybe we'll take a look at our old friends, Phantom Brigade. And um, Industries of Titan. Yeah, so lots of odds for this stuff, but nobody live. Dodge Viper GT, good to see you. Sorry if you're just stopping in. I'm actually wrapping up for tonight. Uh, the mystery game is Johnny Big Time playing The Last of Us Part 1. Um, so I'm happy to, uh, happy to host Brace Yourself Games, or I'm happy to host Johnny Big Time, and, or if nobody has preferences, uh, you can leave me <laughs> responsible for my own, my own dang channel. <laughs> it's fine to say you don't have an opinion one way or the other, too. Like, I, I realized The Last of Us is something that's been done. Okay, I'm about to make a both sound like solid hosts. Leave it up to you. Well, you know, um, I don't get a chance to host Brace Yourself. So here's one thing I'm going to do. So Johnny gets the shout out. So if you, especially if you wind up moving on from Brace Yourself games, I definitely recommend Johnny because he is 
quick-witted uh, and tends to play more exciting games than me, which is not to suggest, oh, hang on, looks like... Probably, I think um, that's on the docket, but... Yeah. Brace yourselves oh, actually wrapping oh, up. There should be some fun, fun and Halloween stuff, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, once again, <laughs> this is Chloe and Vivian, and uh, yeah, we had a lot of... I hope, Vivian, you had a lot of fun doing it, so, you know... Thank you, thank you everyone for the great prompts and great, great comments. Okay, <laughs> yeah. so never mind. We're gonna, we're gonna uh, host. Um, <laughs> we're gonna host Johnny Big Time. Um, so yeah, never mind. Screw, screw those brace yourself people. Um, but yeah, so definitely check out the um, definitely check out the brace yourself channel. I'll give them the shout out. Uh, um, oh. Can't, not active, wait a minute and try again. Um, but yeah, no, in this case here, um, that's fine. Um, hopefully you all know where to find them. I'm gonna shut up and get some work done. Thank you again, everybody, for watching. I'm very sorry for those of you who just came in recently uh, to Cree, um, possibly Dodge Viper, you might've just been lurking. Either way, uh, again, thank you all for watching. I'm gonna do my best to have a proper full stream on Friday, um, and then uh, we can, um, we can take it from there. It's going to be a bit weird for the next week. It's Canadian Thanksgiving this coming Monday, but because I had to skip this mon like Monday this week, I might try and do that in, you know, instead. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It's going to be touch and go for the next little while. I can definitely say uh, the 14th and the following Monday, I'm not going to be able to stream because I'm going to be out of the country. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to try and be back to regular, regular plans. But have a lovely evening. Please enjoy Johnny. We'll see you next time. It is a long weekend. Yes. Treat yourself right, Vanguard Master. <laughs>